a pleasure to be here. My name is Mirjana Voitel. I'm the CEO of Space Society Switzerland. We have big, big um, pleasure to partner with Brainy on this webinar. Brainy has been founded by two of our members, CFH Artic holders, Luca Vicenzi and Patrick Risi. And Brainy is a local prop rep provider for um, CFA Institute certificate in ESG investing. So it's my pleasure to introduce you to Luca Vicenzi. He is a um, seasoned professional. He has more than 10 years of experience in asset management. And Luca is going to guide us through the content of the curriculum. Also, about the best prep strategies. Brain has a lot of questions, prep questions. They have mock exams. So Luca is the right person to talk about the concept. Luca, I think you will mention all changes coming to the curriculum as of first of January next year. Correct. All right. Thank you very much for the for the warm uh, welcome, Nita. It's uh, it's always a pleasure to uh, collaborate, uh, with you guys. And thank you everybody who's uh, who's dialed in. Um, you know exactly. So the the purpose of uh, today's call is really just um, you know walk you through what is the CFA ESG exam. Um, so we're going to spend time on just an overview of what to expect, and so quite a few topics uh, that we want to touch on. Kind of the the, the beginning of uh, beginning of this webinar um, uh, with regards with regards to uh, the sub of the exam, um, and then we would talk a little bit about nine chapters that are included in the in the exam. Um, you know, what the curriculum uh, really just focus on what are the key cons for each of, of the different chapters um, and then uh, touch on the changes that, that are expected um, from uh, from the 2022 version, uh, 2023 version to the 2024 version. And then we would open it up uh, for, uh, for Q&A. So but uh, perhaps before I share my slides and I want to, you know, I want to emphasize right now um i'm not the best at uh, at creating slides so my slides look very poor but i hope that the content is going to make up for it um but uh, my business partner and i we had started uh, a couple of years ago um it really came from a deep um understanding that markets are moving and you know change environmental change climate change is happening and the capital is moving in that direction um Mirjana mentioned it at the beginning. I, I've been working for 10 years in asset management and uh, I, I work in a sales role, a uh, large uh, global asset management firm. Oh, my, my mic was muted. Uh, the number of that we had uh, conversations that went from, you know, at earlier stages, kind of five years ago, it was all about financial, you know, financial uh, 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 numbers, uh, you know, philosophy and so on. And over the past five years, there has been a huge tra transition towards um, ESG and climate and sustainability. It's been, you know, um, you know, every every regular fund that, that I speak to in order to sell our funds has really become a pro in in ESG and and the sustainability. Really, it was for me to step up my game as well. So that's how. And then my business partner, he was actually tasked implementing ESG with with his uh, smaller firm back uh, back then. So that's kind of the spirit of uh, of, of Brainy. We're both charter holders. We're both CFA ESG holders. Uh, we're both based in Zurich. So, you know, we're very close with the CFA Society Switzerland. And this is actually a great, um, you know, um, honor to be able to present um, to, to the CFA Society's members about uh, CFA ESG. But, um, you know, let's, uh, let's put that aside. So, <clears throat> I, I started at the beginning um, with, uh, with what our agenda is going to be. Uh, so I will talk about the ESG certificate, just kind of broadly what it is, you know, what to expect, how to prepare. Then we're going to jump into, you know, chapter overview, go from chapter one to chapter nine through, you know, have a, what does it want to explain? And then and then a bit more narrow, what are some of the concepts that are explained um, in those chapters? And then uh, the third bullet point would be changes from the 2023 version to 2020. And then again, uh, Q&A. So um, with the ESG, this, um, you know, characterizing from, from where I come from, uh, you know, management sales, you know, um, I, I know exactly what to expect when I started to study for the CFA ESG. But today I think that, you know, it was quite helpful for people that, um, that have various roles in the financial, uh, financial markets, um, 
private banking wealth management, but even the entire financial value chain, right? If you go from the private client to the, you know, wealth manager, asset manager, investment banking, um, and you've got the, uh, you know, pension funds, um, regulators, different people that really touch the topic of ESG and sustainable finance. Um, it's really, really nice exam just to bring everything in, into one curriculum and study all the terms and all the different definitions and methodologies. So because this, you know, ESG, I, I, I say ESG is kind of an umbrella term for a lot of different things. Um, you know, it is quite wide, uh, but the curriculum is only 500 pages. What that is that it doesn't go too much into that. So it is specifically designed to equip anybody who wants to learn more about sustainability and sustainable investing um, to do so and to learn about everything that touches sustainable finance. So, you know, if you look at the modules, it's exactly that. It's introduction to ESG, the ESG market, the E, S, and G factors, engagement and stewardship, and then ESG analysis, ESG portfolio construction, and investment mandates. So essentially, within this, you, you talk about everything that has to do with sustainability, impact investing, class, um, you know, thematic investing, exclusions, net zero, PRI, all the different topics. That's just to give you an a overall sense of what the exam is. It's going to be very definition, um, not too deep. So nobody's going to come out of this exam and exactly know, you know, what factors to look at, um, you know, and a clear ESG rating on a company. Um, so from that perspective, it's a bit different from the CFA and and I'm assuming that a lot of you have done the CFA. You, you guys are members at the CFA uh, Society. The CFA equips you with really the tools to look at companies, how to transform a financial from US from uh, from um, US GAAP to to IFRS and things like that. The C, rather definitional, rather methodology driven, methodology driven. Um, so it's it's not a, and but but the beauty there is that it's accessible to anyone. So nobody has to have the CFA in order to do the CFA ESG, uh, which which I think is quite a nice thing. It really opens, you know, um, Sam and this knowledge to a wide audience um, that, you know, maybe is not as familiar or that does to go into depth with finance modeling, things like that. Um, so broad, I would say a uh, big overview of everything that is. to do with sustainable investing um facts and figures certificate costs seven uh 795 dollars um i'm gonna later when we talk about changes um but uh, the price has gone up for, for the 2024 uh, version um not changed is the study requirement which is roughly 130 hours of preparation obviously that de depends a lot on uh you know how well versed you are already in in, in e sustainability um, I mean, you know, if you are a financial advisor or investment advisor at a, at, at a private bank and you talk a lot of sustainability offering, um, probably you're quite well versed. Similar if you work in asset management and you, you know, um, you know, you, you do investing and you speak to your ESG analysts, probably you're quite well versed. A lot of things will then sound familiar. Um, but then if you start new, probably you need those 100 and 230 hours. Um, good thing here, again, <clears throat> you, Again, it doesn't build on the CFA, so there is not much of calculation involved. Um, it's really just, uh, you know, definitions. But that doesn't mean that preparation, preparation is not needed because it can be, especially if you're not familiar, it can be quite a nuanced, um, you know, endeavor to understand the difference between, again, impact investing versus uh, social investing, you know, what are green bonds. And so there's a ton of definitions, so those take time to uh, get accustomed to. Exam itself consists of a hundred multiple questions, um, three answers per question. That has gone um, down from four question, four answers, uh, which is quite nice. Uh, it made things a bit easier. Uh, you know, you have an extra ten chance of getting a question right. Um, it is uh, in terms of how you schedule and and you complete the hundred questions in a hundred forty minutes. 
Um, and when it hits submit on the exam, you you know you already see whether you passed or you failed. So it's quite a fast kind of um, uh, 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 results that you get. Um, in terms of after you register, <clears throat> and then you have six months time to schedule your exam. Uh, there's a couple of uh, venues in, in Zurich where you can take the exam. Uh, you can also take it online. Uh, I did. I, I can't speak to the online uh, exam. I did it in person. I prefer to be outside of the home to take exams, uh, but they're just my preference. Uh, my my own preference. So <clears throat> that is kind of the generalist uh, of what the exam is. The overview of what it does. Um, I'm very happy to to jump into questions later in mind because screen shared and I don't see uh, the Teams chat or or anything else. Uh, so if you don't mind, we can pause the quiz for later, but uh, definitely write them down. Uh, if we move ahead, <clears throat> so here we go with uh, you know my non-existent uh, um, uh, my non-existent uh, PowerPoint skills. Um, this 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 slide just uh, what with the slide is just capture the essence of chapter one. Chapter one is introduction to ESG investing, and uh, on a very high level, it's quite a short um, quite a short chapter. On a very high level, um, you are given, you know, the first kind of introductory remarks into ESG, um, and also kind of it. Chapter one really, really is here to to hint you to everything that's gonna come with uh, with the rest of the curriculum. So you know, they explain a little bit, not into too much detail, what. But what ESG stands for, environmental, social, and governance factors, um, the, 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 um, the notion of materiality, financial materiality. What should you focus on when you do ESG research? Should you worry about the, you know immaterial issues? You know, probably with resource constraints, you don't want to do that. Um, gives you a little bit of a distinguishing, uh, you know, a, a distinction between responsible investing, impact investing, best in class, thematically driven. Um, Talks a little bit about the, uh, the the concept of the triple bottom line and corporate social responsibility. So those are kind of a um, you know, those are kind of a concepts that stemmed out of the 80s and 90s, where corporations started to include more uh, a social uh, you know social tone to their um, to or a, a social counter to um, you know to, to pure capitalism you know gets at all costs uh, notions that were there before. Um, it highlights something that's that that is important to know the Stockholm Resilience Center's nine planetary boundaries because that's really where everything is built on. Um, those are the you know the nine planet, planet boundaries. Uh, essentially, it's a graph that shows you all the you know climate risks that the world is exposed to today, and and really that, you know seeing that uh, graph. <clears throat> I don't win on, on on these slides, but really seeing that why. Why there is this urgency for uh, reaching net zero by 2050? Um, so you know, seeing that droughts are going to increase, uh, hurricanes are going to increase, um, you know, uh, all all these different uh, different uh, issues that we are going to face um, make it quite drastic. Why ESG investing, climate investing is so important? Um, it touches on the, the discussion about fiduciary duty. Uh, this is quite important and probably. Many of you will have had the same conversations uh, the last two years. If you think about the last 10 years, the first eight of the last 10 have been positive for ESG investing and climate investing and things like that. Returns have been still a lot of capital has gone into, into those uh, areas. And in the last two years, obviously, we know that there have been quite a bit of headwinds into um, ESG and, uh, sustainability. Um, and a lot of clients have backed out of the commitments to you know to to invest a bit more so responsible so it or or, or values with the, you know with the no thing is investing in thematic investing say do you stand behind this or not and it's completely fair for many to not stand behind that but specifically with ESG investing um you know ESG integrating ESG into your investment process really means looking at three more factors you already look at 20 factors oh Somebody is sharing the screen, I think, and kick me out.
Let me share it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, the notion of fiduciary duty. Um, it's just adding three more factors to your entire research. I think today, in today's day and age, I think you don't be looking at ESG if you are truthful about you know conducting fundamental research because if there is risk that you you know that there's going to be litigations or things like that, you want to be ahead of that. So moving on, it talks about secular mega. Those obviously are also underlying the um, you know big changes, demographic changes, wealth inequality, technological innovation, emerging market ur uh, urbanization, climate change. Um, the challenges in integrating ESG factors, and then um, the few industry standards that have been uh, that, that have come out um, to date: rating initiatives, policies, applications, uh, signatories, things like so. Kind of the all the policies that have come out. So, quite high level. Uh, to one, um, here we have <clears throat> if we if we had to break it down into five uh, topics that are most important. in chapter one it's definitely the different types of responsible investment we've about it before um the one thing that i said before the stockholm resilience centers and planetary boundaries um again shows all the climate related the planet is facing financial material just that that concept is uh, important to understand and then the challenges a lot has with data that's missing and then the key initiatives, you know, UN Global Compact, UN Principles for Responsible Investment, uh, Sustainable Development Goals, and so on. Chapter two <clears throat> um, does, uh, it, you know, on, a, on a high level, does uh, explain about the history of ESG investing. Um, you know, what were the main uh, drivers of why ESG came to be a topic, especially kind of on the governance side, you know, uh, and it's going to go deeper in, in the in chapter six, which is governance, or five, which is governance. But kind of the history. So, what were the leading um, events in in investing over the past, you know, that led to ESG investing that we know it today? <clears throat> it talks about the actor, actor ESG investing. Um, I had mentioned at the at the beginning of the call that you know ESG investing really touches the entire financial value chain. Uh, from the you know private investor to to you know institute investors, wealth managers, uh, policy makers, and so on. So really, it it gives you a high, you know a, a kind of overview of how ESG investing touches all the different uh, actors, um, the the different asset classes and their ESG integration. So they will learn that um, you know equities are far advanced in ESG integration as a as a asset class versus uh, hedge funds, for instance. Um, then um, still on the topic of you know and 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 uh, and the different actors in ESG, you see kind of what are the motivations to integrate ESG. Uh, for some, it's it's reputational. For others, it's value driven. Or other, it's it's a risk management tool. Um, again, service providers. So it's really the G market of who plays into ESG investing. And we will also uh, see kind of the regional differences. How Europe is further ahead versus uh, the U.S., but the U.S. is catching up. We've got um, you've got Asia that's coming there as well. Um, Canada were quite advanced as well. Nordics and so on. So it gives you a little bit of a regional um, of which countries and which uh, governments, especially, are at. If we had to break it down <clears throat> into the five most important picks, it's uh, ESG investing in numbers, which breaks it down by country, investor type. Um, the market drivers of ESG and challenge, challenges in ESG investing integration. Um, it's a high level idea of how different actors engage with each other, uh, asset owners, asset managers, fund promoters, and services. This is really more has has more to do with asset management, um, all the different uh, all the different uh, categories that it touches. Uh, so you've got the asset owner, which is the private client. You've got the asset managers who produce the product. But then if fund promote, um, 
they don't mean marketing or event. Uh, they, they really mean a, a wealth manager. If the wealth manager doesn't put it in front of the client or doesn't, um, you know, the whole thing dies uh, essentially at the at the delivery stage. So um, talks about that. <clears throat> Policymakers, regulators, investees, government, civil society, and the academia. That's kind of one later topic. you a little bit of a sense of um you know how governments and 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 academia think about ESG investing and and there's a, a quite a quite a bit of case studies as well that show you know the results of uh, how ESG is taken into consideration by all these different actors um <clears throat> chapter three uh it's you know environmental factors so it's the e in ESG um there we go so um, donut economics is the same the uh, Stockholm Resilience Center's nine planetary boundaries. So we'll see again kind of uh, why E is important, why environment, climate change is important. Um, in Finch, there is, uh, there is climate change mitigation and there is climate change adaptation, where mitigation essentially means, um, you know, investing in things that help to reduce um, carbon emissions and and uh, lead to a net zero world, whereas climate adaptation means, you know, a, a, a lot of greenhouse gases are, uh, are already, um, you know, in the, in the atmosphere, so we can't really change that for the, at least not for the next 20 years. So we have to kind of adapt to the next years, um, to, you know, to, 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 to more extreme weather events and things like that. So climate change adaptation talks about, um, what are the steps that we can take today to deal with the changes that are already happening, um, you know, things like that include uh, buying, uh, you know, hurricane resistant widows or things like that. Um, <clears throat> then, uh, you know, you, you get a little bit of a scientific uh, explanation of the greenhouse gas their impact, um, the melting of permafrost, dieback of Amazonas and, and things to that extent. Uh, circular economy as a concept is explained. Um, that, that that's tied in with supply chains, of course. Um, it made into uh, social economic impact. So you go from envir environment connecting with with society. Um, so the in, the climate change's impact on you know, liability, workability, food system food security, uh, impact on physical assets and infrastructure, natural capital, that kind of uh, stuff. Then we they they toes into uh, natural resources and biodiversity loss, which, you know, it's obviously a, that, that could be an exam in itself, a big topic, but uh, there's going to be some element of that, you know, uh, land forestry, uh, pollution, waste management, water management. Um, <clears throat> finally, we, you know, the, the curriculum talks about the, um, the, the, you know, most prominent kind of environmental piece uh, with the Kyoto Protocol that started, then the Paris Agreement that replaced it. Um, the task force on climate related financial disclosures T uh, tfsd tfcd that's, that's i think that's the acronym uh tcfd there you go um which uh, would uh, you know a great job in uh engaging with firms to disclose their you know uh environmental data um you know i, I can you know if I, if I take a side step and think of uh, our wellington work here uh working with T tcfd just to engage with with uh, with holdings that we own to release things like um, the uh, you know where where the, the geolocations of their their most important sites just to understand if we have you know that you produce most of your goods in in Florida and you derive them from and so on we can map out what your climate risk is as a company and then we can extrapolate that and, and make it into a whole portfolio level risk so.
Diaz has been a good initiative for that. Um, talks about the carbon risk premium. Again, if you have the data, you can you can start um, uh, um, working out a risk. So, for instance, if you hold a bond, uh, you know, a municipal bond out of Michigan, one out of Florida, probably if they have the same maturity, they will have an, a, a, a similar yield. But the credit risk or the, the climate risk on one is way higher than the other one. Um, so you can kind of uh, play uh, uh, climate uh, uh, trades. Um, scope one, two, and three. That's the scope uh, of uh, green gas emissions uh, across your your, your operations. Then bought um, the the bought uh, kind of uh, um, business, and then as well the consumption of your services. Uh, science based targets that has to do with um, companies uh, to credibly reduce their um, their carbon footprint effect of climate risk on company valuation. I mean, that ties everything together. <clears throat> but again, the, the most important kind of five, um, topics in chapter two would be climate change mitigation and climate change adaptation, uh, supply chain, who, you know, that also talks a lot about who are the worst polluters, um, history of the different conventions. Um, you know, there's the UN Work Convention on Climate Change, Kyoto Protocol, Paris Agreement, and then analyzing climate risk, how risk impact uh, impacts company valuation. Uh, now here again, it's more descriptive, I would say, the way uh, that you know that one uh, sub chapter is uh, described. It's not really you don't walk out of this and you know know exactly how to value a company with uh, climate risk, um, but it gives you that you know it, it explains the tools that climate risk analysts would look at when they would do that. And with risk implementation. Move chapter four, social factors. Um, so social factors, as, as the name suggests, we had E. Now this is the S in ESG. Um, talks about social megatons, uh, and those include globalization, auto and AI. AI has obviously been quite a topic this year. Uh, wealth creation, digital disruption, social media. Uh, access to electronic devices. Uh, that's quite um, the topic as well in, in emerging markets where a lot of people don't have a phone, for instance, which we take for granted. Uh, changes to work, leisure time, and education. I mean, the change to work, um, think about working from home. That's been uh, that's been a big topic. And then how the more leisure time for all of us. Um, traffics, um, and longevity, urbanization, religion. So it talks about kind of all the social megatrends as opposed to just the you know me megatrends or, or the environmental megatrends um, and that, how these impact different people. You've got the <clears throat> internal social factors, of course, that that, 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 that means in the, your uh, MPs external with uh, number one your your that that uh, that uh, that you serve, but also your clients, your uh, your uh, supply, um, and and just. Uh, companies that are or people that are outside of your immediate company. Uh, you've got the topic of human capital development, uh, employment standards, and health and safety. And there it touches on a uh, an incident that happened in Bangladesh. Where, um, Essentially, a build down um, because of poor uh, quality of, uh, of the of the construction, and uh, and uh, and and the you know, large amount of people died because of that. Um, so that it talks about health and safety. Um, as a you know, next to the, the social mega trends, there are anti mega trends um, that have social impacts. We talked about it before in 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 D in S as well. Climate change and transition risks. What what is mass migration? So mass, mass migration is really the concept of, uh, you know, the Middle East gets, so if if the earth warms a more degrees and you have summers that reach 50 degrees, you know, how much longer can can humanity sustain in that region? Uh, and will we see kind of a, a transition from from people into colder areas and then colder areas 
it's usually and uh, and everything on that on that uh, on that uh, sphere. So you know, mass migration. Then what what would that mean in terms of uh, how should should handle those things? So obviously, with a lot of compassion, but so you want to make sure you, you that your country and your nation also stays intact. So uh, it, it it comes with risks. Um, product line consumer protection falls into social. Um, also obviously, we all know what what, what that is. Um, modern slavery, labor rights, and human rights um, that falls into social factors. And then uh, we, you know, similar to what we explained before, um, met, you know, they look at the meta react social risk uh, on a country, sector, and company level. So again, you know, if you are a as a manager and you engage with your the company that you hold, uh, does it make sense for you to include every single? ESG issue that you find out, or or would you rather engage those that have financial materiality that, if engaged successfully and if the company changes it successfully, you will actually share price or the EPS numbers, and that that's really the concept of materiality. Is it financially material enough to you know make a change? <clears throat> Most important topics in chapter four: social megatrends, uh, internal social factors, uh, the excess materiality and how to apply social factors in company uh, analysis. Chapter five is uh, corporate governance. Um, so I, I did mention it at the beginning, but there had been, um, there had been uh, past, um, you know, accounting skills, corruption scandals, thing that really, uh, number one, help in shareholder friendly. Um, and essentially, a company belongs to shareholders, not to the management. Um, but, uh, this chapter really talks a lot about the different scandals that happened. Uh, you know, you have Caparo, Polybag, Maxwell Mirror, uh, Enron, Armalat, Ahold, Welcome, all these different uh, scandals. And those get kind of taken as a poster child of how it should not be. And then a new standard or a new regulation gets built around that. So. You get a little bit of a history view of the scandals happened and how you know uh, audit got got the uh, or rem, rem, remuneration got stricter, you know accounting got uh, got stricter. So Corporate governance. <clears throat> the the overarching topic here is the principal agency problem. Again, you um, you know you've got the shareholder class that's essentially presented by the board, and then you have the management company um, that doesn't belong to them necessarily, and <clears throat> and that create that um, disconnect can create uh, a little bit of a uh, um, you know, uh, a, a misalignment of agency talks about the alignment of those two things and how an effective board would you know would be able to uh you know to closely observe how the company reacts you know you get in this chapter you you get told um, how the different board rules you know or best board rules how many years should a board member uh you know uh switch switch out or rotate out of uh Board, you know how many years after he left the company should he be instated as a board uh, member and things to that nature. Uh, talks a lot about rights, executive pay, other practices, again board structure, accountability and alliance. The two, the two A's, um, the different committees in a board, nomination committee that meets uh, candidates for for chief positions, audit committee, remuneration committee, um, <coughs> corporate governance frameworks and codes were essentially. Um, established there all these scandals happened. Um, shareholder engagement, and that's actually going to be chapter six, which is uh, engagement, uh, the regional differences, and um, and then gives you best practices of, you know, how this good corporate governance looks like. Board structure, mem board member experience, uh, division of responsibilities, independence, and so on. How to integrate governance, red flags, and company valuation. So, most important five chap uh, topics in this chapter is uh, 
definitely the governor codes and the scandals that led to them. Um, there are two uh, subjects that's uh, characteristics of active corporate governance. Um, one is what are the best practices and the second is what are the governance red flags. Structural differences per country. Um, there are some differences, for instance, name them by heart, but uh, the French uh, system is a bit different from the German one. I think one separates or one has ended up separating um, you know, uh, the CEO with, with, with the chairman of the board, or you have separate class of boards, you know, so there's differences in, in per country and, um, uh, and, and essentially in this, in this, uh, in this uh, chapter, you went about those. And then also the, the role of the auditor, which is uh, very important. Then, uh, number six is, uh, one of my favorite chapters to be Be honest, because I think this is the most, you know, the most honest way of be, especially if you're a long-term investor. You know, the last thing that you want to do, unless you really think that you know it's horrible what this company does, but you don't want to disinvest, um, you know, from a company. You want to engage with them and be a long, um, you know, engage with them and say, hey, here these are the issues that we important financially material SG issues. You know, it, it's it's not values based. It's not value values based. It's really it's based on um, you know if you don't fix those these are real risks that that we that we have, and uh, and these can lead to financial um, financial uh, punishment. Um, so engagement really talks about this. And good stewardship is be a good steward um, for you know for investing companies. It's it's at the heart of the of the UNPRI. If you subscribe or if you're signatory to the UNPRI, um, you one of the <clears throat> one of the articles in there is that uh, you uh, you know you pledge to to um, conduct engagement. Obviously, if you're a small player; it's more difficult. Rather, big company that has uh, you know specific and uh, you know analysts and engagement officers and things like that. You can. Uh, uh, you can work with uh, with third parties as well to kind of pledge to the, to those causes, um, but engagement is is um, it, you know is is quite and, and it is one of the things that you need to do if you want to be a signatory to the RI. Um, it uh, it goes quite deep into the topic of engagement and stewardship um, because there are different dynamics that are involved in engaging. Uh, one is the communicative uh, communicative dynamics, learn dynamics, and then political dynamics. Um, you know, uh, talks about the Walker report, which was uh, was essentially you know um, the, the the main you know main report that uh, that talked about uh, engaging and being a good student. Um, so it really came out of that. Um, there are monitoring and engagement commissions. If you're investor, um, you you talk quite regularly with. Um, I can talk from my experience again, side side conversation, but. Uh, uh, at the framework, uh, we we conduct more than fifteen thousand um, conversations with management companies. Uh, a lot of them are engagement conversations, but many of them are just regular conversations about uh, EPS numbers, about you know investment, um, you know, and capital expenditures. It's like you know, in a financial nature, M and A's and things like that. And then engagement conversations really talk ESG issues. So th those two are a bit different. Um, it gives engagement escalation process, which means what if you are a long-term oriented investor, you love the company, you reach and nothing happens. What are kind of the next steps that you can take, which the eventual step is investing from the company. But there are a number of steps that, that come for that. Uh, proxy voting, um, voting on behalf of your, the underlying client. Um, in many cases, those are pension funds. Many pension funds insource that again and do it themselves. Um, some outsource it to the manager and then it's, uh, you know, you can vote on behalf of your client. Um, <clears throat> stewardship code.
code um, um, principle, the principles in the stewardship codes. There is uh, a number of different uh, stewardship country. Uh, I believe the first one that uh, launched was the UK. Um, and these are again just principles um, how to you know be a bit steward in investing. Then when you talk about engaging, there's there's uh, two ways really, the two two by two ways to do it. There's top down or bottom up. Uh, top down is uh, like you know you buy a full sector and just engage with all of them. It would be more issue based. Uh, for instance, um, look a good example. But you know you want all companies to 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 uh, to to um to set science based targets. So you, you don't really care about this individual company. You just this one issue to be solved. So you just engage top down issue based or differences or or the the the, the other option is up and company based. So you you know you discover one specific issue specific company and bring that to light. Um, collective element is the notion of um, you know. Uh, I think a group of shareholders and then collectively engage that obviously create way more power on the on the shareholder and on the engagers part. Um, and then there again are differences across classes. As a you know, as a large shareholder, you you hold a lot of power. If you own bond, maybe less so. If you if you invest in private equity, uh, a private equity company is quite successful. They can select which investors they want with. So there's different difference how much power you hold when you engage. Um, most important topics in chapter six: uh, the different stewardship codes, uh, the different engagement styles, goal setting and escalating, proxy voting, um, asset classes. So chapter seven, and as I said, I'm talking a lot, and uh, I want to leave uh, some room for questions. But chapter seven, I call this uh, meat and potato chapter. Chapter seven. This really goes into you know to the heart of you know CFA and ESG. It's ESG analysis, valuation, and integration. And here, if I remember correctly, yes, um, one one slide didn't fit all the uh, all the topics. Um, but you know, um, just glance over these slide over the slides, you see that uh, you know it brings back the topic of fiduciary duty. Do ESG factors detract returns? That's the big question being asked. And then what you as a steward for you know, your client's capital, what are you supposed to do? Um, you know, quantitative and quantitative and quantitative analysis, reiteration stage, ESG integration framework, uh, scorecards, company, you know, having a scorecard of ESG issues, um, reality assessment and risk mapping that go back to is it financially material? And and by the way, just to quickly break here, um, see that there's a lot of overlapping. Um, you know, topics throughout the, you know, chat, throughout the CF ESG curriculum. That is uh, the case. And, uh, and uh, I'm going to talk later about changes, but the CFA has uh, done some work to remove some of the overlaps, um, which resulted in a nice uh, reduction in, in slides. Um, <clears throat> elements of integration. So what are ways to, um, you know, to conduct ESG analysis? You know, once you have once you have discovered that the company has ESG issues and they don't address You can adjust forecast financials. You can adjust valuation models. You can adjust credit risk. Um, how to manage the risk? Uh, you know, can uh, include ESG factor tills or moment, ESG momentum tills. That means is a company improving? You know, it could be a nice uh, leading factor to stronger performance going forward. Strategic asset, asset alloc allocation, um, uh, tactical asset allocation, ESG controversies, and positive ESG as as uh, signals to include a company. Um, so these are the elevation. How you can you how can you integrate ESG and tools of ES? Um, those are red flag indicators, company questionnaires, and management interviews. Check with outside experts, watch lists, internal ESG research, e external ESG research, ESG agenda items, and then uh, moving uh, with chapter seven. 
um, there's uh, there's the concept of um, you know non-managed ESG, risk, which is unmanageable risk. You know, some things you know some things are just exposed to, and then the difference is the management gap, which is where does management not uh, consider ESG material ESG uh, risks, um, and then back to uh, what we did before. How to integrate this risk is by forecasted uh, financials, valuations you can change, cost of capital or ter- terminal growth, valuation multiples, uh, financial ratios, internal credit uh, assessments, assumptions in qualitative models. Um, one big thing uh, that this chapter talks ESG disclosure and data quality. There's a big, big um, challenge in ESG. Uh, because ESG data is still to date in in many instances uh, voluntary, and some companies overshare, some companies undershare, some companies are, are just too small to share, but actually they would they do the right things, but they don't talk about it. So there is a lot of you know uh, data quality issues, and that's one big issue. Um, and then there is criticism, ESG adoption. Um, for instance, if you're a manager, you know there's obviously the the uh, issue of greenwashing industry um the, you know dubious or vague assessment criteria that allow you to include too many companies uh, so we really draw the line what is the, your real impact uh, all of this is is captured in, in, in chapter seven um here the services to investment analysts that's esg data rating screenings voting and governance advice esg bank benchmarks and ind- indices uh, ESG uh, use and controversy alerts, integrated research and risk. Sorry, talking a little bit fast. I just want to get through everything. Uh, but chapter eight would be what I I call the second meat and potato uh, chapter. Um, this is uh, here you you remove yourself one step, and you go from you know uh, ESG company evaluation to ESG portfolio construction. Right? So um, it talks a lot about gas allocation frameworks. Um, if you apply exclusions, how does that change um, you know, your portfolio? In many cases, if you exclude, um, you know, energy companies, you will for sure have growth, uh, you know, tilt um, versus the world. Um, so what does that mean for you? Do you want to have that increased growth uh, tilt or not? Um, <clears throat> here it talks about, again, you, you are a, a portfolio manager in this, in this uh, scenario. In In chapter seven, you're an analyst here, your portfolio manager. It talks about the different um, that you have and the sources that you have, sell-side research, investment consult research, third-party ESG data providers, and, and so on. Um, it, uh, it actually goes into the uh, differences between the analyst role and PM role. And in, in a lot of uh, cases, you still have a super seasoned uh, portfolio manager confronted with a more junior interested in, in kind of a sustainability analyst and in in many instances it's very hard to challenge the more senior portfolio manager um you've got sg due diligence of asset managers so if you run pension fund for instance um how do you you know what do you do your asset manager for in terms of um uh, g um they in this chapter they also talk about exclusions the different types of exclusions universal conduct related faith based idiosyncratic um then the different uh, ESG bonds. So also what what it's uh, what this chapter talks about is ESG for the different asset classes. And one asset class is fixed income. So it talks about the different uh, ESG bond types, which are green bonds, sustainability bonds, uh, sustainability linked bonds, transition bond, SDG linked bonds. Um, and um, the EU taxonomy and that's so Article Six, Eight, and Nine. Many of you will be familiar with terms. ESG implementation strategies, so full ESG integration, exclusionary screening, positive alignment, different uh, approaches to integrate ESG in your portfolio construction. And by the way, I left out in chapter seven, chapter eight, I left out the five most relevant, uh, in my estimation, those two chapters deserve that number one, you twice. And uh, and there is no 
help you in that, you know, in, in those two chapters. You have to do the entire thing and really understand the entire thing. Those those are the most two chapters um, by far. Also, the most, you know, the two are mostly weighted. And then finally, chapter nine. Um, it's back to the topic of accountability and alignment, but this time from uh, a pension fund manager's view and an asset manager's view. So greenwashing is the big, uh, is the big uh, uh, topic. Double agency uh, as well. You've got the, you know, the folks who holds, you know, uh, share, shares on behalf of the Their pension uh, takers who sublet who, who uh, uh, outsources management to an asset manager who then buys the stock. So you've got a lot of different uh, uh, points where the the you know the the essentially the the um, uh, the interest of the end holder of the capital uh, could misalign with with these different points. Um, clarifying client needs, you know. What is the uh, you know defined ESG investment strategy that you want? So just again, if you if you took seven as the investment analyst's view, chapter eight is the portfolio manager's view, chapter nine is the pension fund manager's view. So you know it's also how do you hold accountable uh, your the manager manages your uh, assets on ESG things. Just back to the topic of RFPs and due diligence, uh, EVs, the different investments and why they they like ESG. Uh, or why they would do ESG. Uh, here, the most relevant chapters are the PSLA stewardship chap checklist. So, different. Uh, it's a useful guide to defining, you know, the ESG strategy, RFP, diligence, manager selection, um, the different investor types, uh, monitoring and challenging asset managers. That one is quite important. Uh, you want to avoid greenwashing um, and then reporting and measurement. So, I've <laughs> talked to. Uh, a lot. Uh, this is uh, this uh, this actually brings me to the last um, scripted uh, you know agenda point, which is the upcoming changes. And the changes have are 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 minimal, to be honest. So you know, hopefully, we can spend very you know briefly here. But one is that during the transition period, there's going to be two exams. So I sent a few subscribe to the uh, ECSG um, from today until end of the year. So 31st of, uh, the, of, of December. You will still be tested on the 2023 um, of, uh, of the curriculum. If you uh, enroll and register starting 2024, January 2024, you will be tested to prepare and to take the exam, meaning that if you we wish to do the 2023 version do until december 2023 the enrollment and actually take exam is gonna you know is gonna be uh, available for you until um june 30th of 2024 so no matter when you um when you enroll you're gonna have six months the difference is when you enroll it's gonna determine whether you do the 2023 version or the 2024 version in general the curriculum is gonna uh, be, um the same in terms of chapters, so it's going to be nine chapters, no changes to that, no changes to the structure of the uh, or curriculums. Um, the most changes are going to occur in chapter seven. Um, we mentioned uh, before that they uh, are going to remove some of the um, uh, duplicacy throughout the curriculum. That's going to slim it down a little bit to roughly, I think, 570 or so pages. So think of you know, maybe 520 or so. And uh, again, they have uh, a, a price uh, assessment and they uh, figured out that they uh, are a little bit too cheap. So they re revised it up to uh, 865 going forward for uh, next year. Questions? Um, I want to uh, end it here. It has been a real pleasure to have you guys on. Um, thank you very much. Um,
hosting this hour with us. I hope that you know what uh, what we have presented has been helpful for you to determine whether the CFA ESG is for you or not. Um, you know, Patrick is on the line as well, Miriana as well. Um, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, I you know now I'm talking with my Brainy hat on. Uh, Brainy is a prep provider from Zurich. Basically, I'm also CFA Society volunteer, so. You know, I, I really, I really love the collaboration of, of you know, in all these different uh, senses. But uh, please do reach out if uh, if we can be of any help, or if you want to have more advice, or jump on a call with us. So, you know, thank you again to everybody, and uh, wish you all a great evening. Thank you. Bye bye. Questions. Um, I wanna. Uh, ended here. It has been a real pleasure to have you guys on. Um, thank you very much um, for spending this hour with us. I hope that you know what uh, what we have presented has been helpful for you to determine whether the CFA ESG is for you or not. Um, you know, Patrick is on the line as well, Miriana as well. Um, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, I you know now I'm talking with my brainy hat on. Uh, Brain is a prep provider from Zurich based uh, CFA charter holders. So we are very close to you guys. Um, I, me personally, I'm also CFA society volunteer. So, you know, I, I really, I really love the collaboration of, of you know, in all these different uh, senses, but uh, please do reach out if, uh, if we can be of any help or if you want to have more advice or jump on a call with us. So, you know, thank you again to everybody and uh, wish you all a great evening. Thank you. Bye bye. Um, I want to uh, end it here. It has been a real pleasure to have you guys on. Um, thank you very much um, for spending this hour with us. I hope that you know what uh, what we have presented has been helpful for you to determine whether the CFA ESG is for you or not. Um, you know, Patrick is on the line as well, Miriana as well. Um, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, I you know now I'm talking with my brainy hat on. Uh, Brain is a prep provider from Zurich based uh, CFA charter holder. So we are very close to you guys. Um, I, me personally, I'm also CFA society volunteer. So, you know, I, I really, I really love the collaboration of, of you know, in all these different uh, senses. But uh, please do reach out if, uh, if we can be of any help or if you want to have more advice or jump on a call with us. So, you know, thank you again to everybody and uh, wish you all a great evening. Thank you. Bye bye.